So we're here. It is February 5th. The time now it is 6.39 p.m. on Wednesday, February 5th, 2020 at the AGO. Pantros and her lovely husband Chris is here. The poet's here. We've been hugging everybody. I just met Ibby. <laughs> He's taking photos. Um, I see professors. I see pe uh, people and folks and everybody. So it's all exciting. It's all exciting. Desmond's mom's here. 
You're okay me recording you? Okay, sure. Yeah. You said you're so happy. No, I said I'm so happy. So I even went to the bookstore yesterday and just took a picture of the books on Aww. the shelf. Because... You're so proud. Such a pleasure to meet you. Nice meeting you. Finally, too. I was all looking for it. I said, I'm going to meet Desmond's mom today, probably. Yeah, this is Dion. Dion yeah, that's I don't know if you got to the part of the book with Dion yet. <laughs> but, yeah. um, I almost finished it, but I wanted to finish it, but you know, I go back and forward, you know. I know. Yeah. This so, is recording, uh, just letting you know. Uh, yes, good, good. You're okay? I'm good. I'm recording so I can pause it. I like the show. Good evening. Welcome. Okay. I'm uh, Davian Saltzman, the Director of Programming at the AGO, and I'm so excited to welcome you to the launch of Desmond Cole's The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. Woo! 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 So I want to acknowledge where we are. We are in Tecoronto, part of the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and more recently, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa nations. In late 2018, the federal government apologized for violating the Williams Treaties and awarded land and financial compensation to the affected First Nations. Decolonization is not a metaphor. Giving back the land is not a metaphor. We must understand and fulfill our obligations as treaty people and our duties to this land, to each other, and to future generations. I want to thank Andrew and Another Story Bookshop, an amazing community space, an amazing literary space. Possible, and who is our official bookseller. She brought us this program. I was very excited that we could do it here at the AGO. I'd like to thank Kathleen McLean and Annie Roper, assistant curator and curatorial assistant for talks, for putting tonight's event together. And Penguin Random House of Canada, Scott Sellers, Martha Kenya Forstner. Before I introduce Martha, who's going to introduce Desmond to read, I need to note something about tonight's evening. We've had a slight change in plans. Unfortunately, Norbese Philip was fell sick last mm. night and is unavailable to be here due to her health. But we have a wonderful panel of guests we'll introduce a little later. Beverly Bain, Philip D. Morgan, and Therese Mason Pierre. So I will welcome you in a second yet. But for now, please welcome Martha Kenya Forstar, who edited this book. Thank you. Um, I don't think that Desmond Cole needs any introduction. Um, so I'm happily going to grab this time to talk to you a little bit about the Desmond that I know. Um, for four years, I had the pleasure and the privilege of watching the skin I'm in become the book it needed and wanted to be, a book of profound importance and exceptional accomplishment. I watched as Desmond brought to the page the urgency of the struggle for black life in Canada. I witnessed Desmond's determination to tell the story of one year with sensitivity and care and to support it with rigorous reporting. I watched as, to get closer to the truth, Desmond framed 2017 within a deeply researched understanding of the history of anti-black racism in Canada. I watched as he developed a razor-sharp political analysis of white supremacy in this country. And I watched, too, as Desmond drew from his own past and present to add notes of remarkable intimacy and impact to the book. I watched and I listened. Desmond and I had long phone calls working on the edit together. Desmond wanted to make sure that he got every word right. Sometimes he needed to read the manuscript out loud to know that he had. And as an aside, I will say that all of you will hear for yourselves the results of that attention this evening when Desmond reads from the stage. And I'll say, too, that the force of his words 
read in his voice is captured in the audio version of the book. A little bit of a marketing book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Through this process, I was changed in ways that I can't quite express. But I know when Desmond was reading those passages to me, it was not my ears he was thinking of. Desmond wrote this book with unmatched integrity and devotion to honor his family and his community, to do justice to their struggle and their spirit, and to further their fight for freedom. Alicia Elliott, another writer of great integrity, beautifully and perfectly described the skin we're in as an act of radical generosity. It is my huge pleasure to introduce now the author of this book <coughs> and the giver of this amazing gift, Desmond Cole. with so many people who made this book possible, um, but nobody did more to make this book possible and this journey that I've been on possible and my life possible more than you have done for me. No one's able to do it. And um, you know that this book is dedicated to Grandma Dora, and I know that in your journey, nobody was able to do more for you than she was. And that's why we still remember her. And that's why I welcome her into the room this evening. Uh, I welcome our ancestors into the room, our family, and mom. Thank you for making this possible. I love you. Lots of other people have made this moment and this work possible. Um, and I'm going to thank all of you over the years to come. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you to Martha who introduced me and who um, helped so much to make this book possible, who guided me and who listened really, really well, who was always available, who crisis managed and troubleshot along with being the editor of this book. Um, Martha, I am so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to my agent. Uh, Jackie Kaiser is here tonight representing Westwood. I know Jake Babbitt couldn't be here. Um, Jackie, you've been with me the entire way as has Westwood Creative. Thank you so much. Thank you to the team at Doubleday. Thank you to Ward Hawks. Thank you to my incredible publicist, Scott Sellers. Thank you to everybody at the Doubleday team. Thank you, Another Story Bookshop. Thank you to all the independent booksellers in the city of Toronto and beyond who are going to make this book um, available for audiences. I really appreciate you. Um, thank you to all my friends who have come this evening and who I haven't been able to say hello to yet. But uh, I see you all. and. Um, I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you to all of the people who
whose stories um, are able to be included in this book because you spoke with me, you sat with me, you uh, corrected the parts of the story that weren't right, you answered my questions, you shared intimately uh, so that this work could be possible. Thank you, all of you. Um, some of you are here tonight. Um, I'm going to read uh, four passages from the book. We were hoping to have Norbesi, of course, with us, and we miss her, mm -hmm. but um, I chose some different passages on the fly, and I decided that I'm going to read you four uh, passages this evening that all have to do with children, with childhood, with um, youth, and with the way that Anna Blackness affects us from the time that we are very young. Uh, I'll be reading from uh, the chapters January, February, uh, no November, and uh, October, in that order. Each month of this year, 2017, is a chapter of the book, but there are 13 chapters because uh, with January 2018, a new year began, a new set of um, challenges and struggles began, one that I was intimately involved with, um, trying to fight the stop the deportation of Abdul Abdi. And Martha and I got the idea at the same time that it was better to end on a 13th chapter because the year is not complete, the cycle is not complete, the struggle is never complete, and it doesn't end neatly and tidily with a year. So that was what we decided to do. So I'm going to read you um, from four of those chapters each one about um, black young people, starting with myself. As a child in Red Deer, I had no conscious understanding of racism. I knew that outside of the few friends we'd sometimes visit, almost no one in town looked like us or spoke Creole. I knew that the woman called Grandma Carlos, who took care of me when my parents went to work, was white. I knew that Mr. Rogers, whom I watched on her TV every day, was also white. I knew all my neighbors were white. I didn't especially understand what it meant to be black, white, or anything else. If I had realized any of the experiences my parents would speak about as I got older, the stares, unwanted comments, questions, inquisitions, indignities, slurs, and other reactions to our blackness, well, I couldn't begin to process them back then. We moved from Alberta to Ontario when I was five years old and settled in Oshawa. The area is the ancestral territory of the Wendat Nation. The term Oshawa originates from the Ojibwe language, and one common translation is that place at the crossing of the stream where the canoe was exchanged for the trail. In other words, Oshawa's natural harbor on Lake Ontario is a portage, a crossing place. By the time we moved to Oshawa, each of my parents had been able to sponsor their mothers to come to Canada. My dad's mom, Mary, lived with us on the first, in our first house in Oshawa, and Adora, my mom's mom, lived in the neighboring town of Whitby. As a grade one student in Oshawa, I began to feel conscious of my blackness. I was coloring with a group of my classmates, almost all of whom were white. We shared the pencil crayons and drew the things that kids draw. Dark brown for the tree trunks, bright green for leaves and grass, yellow for the sun. Someone asked for the skin color pencil. <laughs> Everyone else seemed to understand that the particular cream color was what she wanted. None of my peers seemed to realize that this label excluded me but I felt it in my bones and never forgot it. As the year went on, I noticed how the cream-colored pencil crayons were always the most used, always worn down to the middle by classmates drawing themselves and their families and their friends. The tree trunk brown was my preference for drawing myself 
and my family, but I never referred to this crayon as skin color, and neither did anyone else. I learned later that Laurentian, the company that made the pencil crayons we used, had for many years named one of its pinkish colors natural flesh. <laughs> the company also produced an Indian red. For 50 years, black researchers in Canada have been documenting the ways schools have continuously failed black students through low expectations, isolation, and harsh discipline. Much of this research is summarized in Toronto's, or sorry, excuse me, Towards Race Equity in Education, the Schooling of Black Students in the Greater Toronto Area, a 2017 York University study by Carl James and Tana Turner. Since the early 1980s, researchers have noted that Toronto schools stream black students into basic or lower level classes more often than any other racial group. The York study includes findings from the 1990s that, quote, by the end of 1992, 44% of black students in the grade nine cohort had graduated, compared to 59% of white students and 72% of Asian students, end of quote. The same study summarizes findings from the Roots of Youth Violence, a 2008 report commissioned by the Ontario government. Quote, suspended and expelled students were more likely to drop out of school entirely and often got involved with criminal activity and, because they were not in school during the day, came under increased scrutiny of the police, end of quote. It's impossible to quantify the psychological toll of this disproportionately harsh treatment of black students and their families. Words of one participant in the York study give us some insight into their daily struggles and fears as black parents. Quote, I have found that it has been very difficult for my son. Early on, he was identified as having a speech and language delay. And due to his young age, he would become frustrated with teachers and ECEs that were not trained to address his needs. When the teachers grew frustrated, they would send him to the office, at which point I would receive a phone call from the principal. There was one incident that I will never forget. The principal advised me that if my son, six years, four years old at the time, and in junior kindergarten, had been in grade six or seven, he would have to call the police on him for his behavior. As shocked as I was, he said it in a very cavalier manner. End of quote. One afternoon in the summer of 2017, I was buying groceries when I encountered a familiar face. A young black man I hadn't seen in many years. We first met at a community center in downtown Toronto in 2007, where I was a youth worker and he a teen who played basketball a couple of nights a week in the gym. I'm protecting his identity in order to tell his story. I'll call him Gerald. When we met in the grocery store, Gerald said he'd recently seen me on TV calling for the removal of police from schools. It reminded me of the stuff that used to go down back at settlement, he said, referring to the community center where we'd met. Did you know about what the cops used to do? I didn't. But I remembered a program called Cops and Kids, an initiative claiming to build relationships between police and local youth and to talk about community safety that used to operate inside of the same center. Gerald agreed to meet with me for coffee sometime so he could tell me more. Gerald wasn't part of Cobbs and Kids. He went to the community center to play basketball with other youth from the neighborhood, most of whom were black. The police program would begin as his basketball program was ending. He says the police used to insist that he and his peers, who had just finished playing basketball and needed time to change their clothes, 
clear out immediately or face consequences. If we were not out of there in an orderly fashion, basically, it's loitering, said Gerald. He told me the police would threaten to ticket him and his friends. They started asking every individual, what's your name? Where are you from? He remembers that sometimes there would be a lineup of boys waiting to leave the center. They were not allowed to leave unless they were first identified, unless they first identified themselves to police. What the police would say is, we know you're from a certain neighborhood, and as a result, if you don't forfeit your first and last name, hmm. you can't even leave from here. So they tried to put people in a box, said Gerald. And some of those people were there for the first time and had no idea what the police were talking about. In March 2017, Black Lives Matter Toronto mobilized people to call their federal member of parliament and demand that Ralph Goodale, the Minister of Public Safety, cancel Beverly Brown's deportation. At the time, Beverly was 31 weeks pregnant, and her doctor had deemed her pregnancy to be high risk. Through social media, many of us sounded the alarm. Beverly's supporters picked up the phone and called the minister. But I will never forget those who tried to waste our time by demanding that we prove Beverly's worth. What had she done to get deported, they asked. Wasn't it true that a pregnant woman could safely travel for up to 36 weeks of her pregnancy? Hmm. Shouldn't she have thought about these things before she overstayed her visa? Wouldn't this set a precedent for other women to come here and get pregnant? I was alone in my apartment in, on March 14th when Sandy Hudson of Black Lives Matter Toronto confirmed via social media that the government had suspended Beverly's deportation order for three months. I was elated at the small victory. The government should never have put Beverly and her pregnancy at risk or made her fear that they would force her to travel. Still, I knew we had done something very meaningful that day. Beverly's baby was born in July, and I didn't hear any more news about her until September, when BLMTO announced that the Canada Border Services Agency had apprehended Beverly and her infant, and had held them in immigration detention. Beverly said that during a CBSA appointment, an official had asked her husband to leave the room. She said that the official then reported her to Children's Aid and took away her baby food. CBSA held Beverly and her son for nearly three days before releasing them and issuing another deportation order. That morning in September, as we took over Young and Bloor for Beverly's press conference, I made my way to the south edge of the intersection. I was one of several people holding up a handmade banner that read, which side are you on? The first vehicle stopped in line at the intersection was a blue Mack truck. When the driver realized we were blocking his path, he lurched the truck forward, stopping only a couple of feet from some of our volunteers. He continued to stare us down and blare his horn. One month earlier, in an anti-racist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, James Alex Fields Jr. was arrested and ultimately convicted of murder after he drove his car into a group of peaceful demonstrators, injuring 19 of them and killing Heather Hare. 32-year-old paralegal. We held the space for 20 minutes, long enough for the media to hear Beverly and her supporters. All I'm asking is to stay with my family. That's all I want, Beverly said, over the incessant blare of horns from angry motorists. Canada is about family, so why do you want to separate us? Thank you very much.
people who will be speaking tonight. Beverly Bain. Beverly is a black queer feminist scholar. Please come up if you wish, as it said. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she teaches in women and gender studies at the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Bain is the author of Fire, Passion, and Politics, the creation of Block Arena as Black Queer Diasporic Space in Toronto, Pride Festivities. Bain is currently working on a series of essays that document Black, radical feminist queer activism in Toronto from the 80s to the present. Therese Mason Pierre, looking for her version. Woo! As a writer and a workshop, her work is appearing in Pulling Fire and Tantheus. She's currently the poetry editor of Alger Magazine, a Canadian speculative and surrealism literature journal. Therese lives and works in Toronto. And Philip Dwight Morgan, yes. He's a Toronto-based writer of Jamaican Heritage. His essays, op-eds, and interviews have appeared in McLean, CBC News, HuffPost, and Rabble. Philip was also has appeared on, Philip, on Breakfast Television and CBC Radio to discuss Toronto School Resource Officer Program, as well as issues of race and representation in Canada. Please give him a big round of applause.
so thanks to my editor, yeah, Stephen. Okay, uh, but but I think that was because I, I it took me a very long time to sort of process um, my feelings um, about this book. Um, I, I felt like all 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 kinds of feelings. I felt happiness and excited, uh, but I also felt uh, anxiety and a little bit of shame um, reading uh, the book. Um, and that was because I had been exposed, in the book, I'd been exposed to um, different kinds of experiences of blackness that were um, different from my own. Um, my experience of blackness in Canada, living in Toronto, I've lived here for about uh, 14 years, ha has been, especially recently, has been one of isolation. Um, I, I, so I, I attended the University of Toronto. Uh, we all know that there aren't a lot of black people at U of T. Um, I attended their first black grad celebration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I found that when, in my classes, I found that I was often the only black person there. I entered U of T as a life science student uh, in a class of about 1,500 people at Con Hall. I could maybe count the number of, of black people on my hand, in my hands. Um, and then I switched to philosophy. Um, and once again, I was one of few uh, black people there. So I've, I've sort of been accustomed to like living my life in Toronto as sort of like the only black person. And it's, it's sad, it's sad to say that I've become very accustomed to it. Um, so I'm, it's great to be in this space, for example. <laughs> um, even like, for example, my master's degree, I was the only black person. Um, so I understood this book as uh, a very strong uh, learning opportunity for me and almost kind of like a, um, an interesting awakening because there was just, I realized that there was so much I didn't know. Uh, and there were so, so many experiences I just hadn't had a chance to ask about or talk to anyone because there weren't a lot of black people around me. So I didn't, you know, I didn't know. Um, so I, I agree with um, Alicia Elliott's comments. Um, about this, about this book being sort of an act of radical generosity because well, as, as I was reading this, I felt that you took care of me, kind of, mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a reader and as a writer. I felt that um, you wrote in a way that sort of sought an experience like mine, like maybe you know, being, being isolated and you said, you know, it's okay. This is what's, this is what's, what else is sort of out here for you. You have a community um, of other people who are, are here and whenever you would like to, to sort of join or to feel confident about sort of being proud uh, of being black um, and looking around and finding more black people uh, that they're here for you. Mm. So thank you. in schools, um, I think it's really important that you you use a story from from a young person, that, that the youth voice is present in that telling of the story, because, you know, in my experience doing some of that work of, you know, fighting policing in schools, um, it was really difficult to center youth voices um, because of the tremendous risk that um, and threat that a number of young people in schools felt from police in schools. Um, and you know, I, I would I would contrast that with something like you know climate justice, for example, where you think about Greta Thunberg, or you think of Audrey Caltee, and there are not a number of prominent youth who are at the forefront of that, that movement, and there are many um, many adults who rush to support them. I can't imagine a situation in which there would be that same support for young people speaking out against anti-blackness. I, I can't. I, it's it's I really can't envision it, right? And so I think there's some really interesting questions to be to be asked about that. Um, but I also just think that, you know, um, kudos to Desmond for sharing that anecdote from a young person because again, there are so many young people who are directly affected here in Toronto and elsewhere by police and schools um, who are unable to share their stories because of the tremendous threat that it held for them and their families. Thank you. And if I can just come back on that and say. I remember those conversations around 
the school boards, Mayor John Tory, um, and other very irresponsible hmm. public leaders saying, well, why don't the, ch the kids just come and tell us if they have a problem, <laughs> right? If you don't like being terrorized and profiled in your school, <laughs> hey, you know what? Come on down to 40 College Street, the headquarters yeah. of the police. The safest space. Maybe go through a, a wanding and a metal <laughs> detector with a thousand of Toronto's finest around you and come tell us what the problem is, hmm. right? The disingenuousness of that, of not recognizing the inherent danger of children, even admitting this to somebody that they trust, that this is what's going on. I'm scared, I don't know what to do. Um, and I think that there's a lot of shame sometimes too in, in having to tell stories of being um, afraid, being afraid as a child of your teachers, being afraid of police, being like, there's a lot of just bottling it up. And then I mentioned too that some kids don't even know what's happening. So when the police come to you and you've always been told to listen to them and to do what they say, you don't understand that this is a documentation and a profiling and a surveillance situation. So just one more thing really quickly, just in terms of um, you were saying the connections back to slavery and connecting this always back. Um, Robin Maynard does this brilliantly in her book, Policing Black Lives. I cited extensively from Robin because Robin's book was wonderful and helpful. And um, the first chapter of this book talks about a gallery space on Earth. We are in a gallery here tonight. And that young man, John, is a black artist who, as a young person, wants to do what so many art, art artists want to do, which is have their own space. He opens up his space. He has a New Year's party at this space, and the police come and they raid the gallery because first, the liquor license people come. Now imagine the liquor licensing people coming to any art gallery in Toronto on New Year's Eve and being like, so where are your permits? <laughs> Nobody cares about no permits. Like, this is not a thing, but for John, they came. Why did they know? Why were they suspicious of his art gallery and operating a party of all the places in Toronto without a permit that night? Anyway, he gave up the few bottles of alcohol that they had and said, okay, our bad, have a nice night. And then 10 minutes later, the cruisers came and the raid happened. So this is apparently liquor license, bylaw, violation, right? Bylaw, simple, like civil violation, not a criminal thing, but John ends up getting criminally charged after they attack him, right? And it's like, I called that chapter Negro Frolics because it reminded me of a story I learned being in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, in, 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 sorry, in, uh, in, uh, see, I'm forgetting the town next to Shelburne now because I'm nervous, but, um, where the, where the, where the, where the, where the museum is. Yeah. But, um, Dogma. is it? No. Near there. Uh, we'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, Birchtown. Okay, Birchtown. Birchtown. Okay. And I went to Birchtown and I saw the museum. It's in the documentary The Skin We're In, actually. And one of the things I learned about was that in the 1780s, when black people came up from the United States, fought with the British to get their freedom away from the Americans. Mm -hmm. And they came up to this place and now what's now Nova Scotia and thought that they might have a chance at freedom. There was a law made immediately within a year of them being there which outlawed Negro frolics. Mm -hmm. What were Negro frolics? You can't drink, you can't dance, you can't party in the street, but only if you're black. And for me, what happened to John in 2017, an art gallery owner, while everybody else in the whole city is wasted and partying, <laughs> But he's not allowed. It's him and his friends who are the threat. That's Negro frolics too. And that's what Robin's book taught me. And that's what so many scholars in this country have reminded us is that we have our own histories in this country. We don't have to talk about that other country that we are not going to talk about. Mm. And continuing on that train of thought is and that conversation is the whole piece on the fact that, you know, black bodies, uh, black kids, uh, are not considered children. Mm. Um, 
uh, black children can be brutalized by police and somehow it can be explained away that those kids were actually a threat, mm. right? And we see this in the school system, right? Um, you know, your, uh, you know, the piece you read um, uh, around the, the black child, right? Who they were gonna call cops if he was just a little older. Um, it's another way in which we see this link to slavery. Black children were treated um, in the most violent, violent way. And we see this every day today in terms of how black bodies are brutalized and black children's bodies are brutalized and black children are considered fearful and violent. So um, we see those connections that continue uh, to proliferate you know, uh, today uh, in, in, as we continue to, uh, to see what's happening. But the other thing I want, I want to move a little away uh, just to give people a sense of what you know, um, sort of the, the full picture of your book in terms of um, while we are talking about the everyday violence that black people and black children experience in the school system and also every day or everyday lives, I would also say that your book itself was about resistance and black resistance black resistance against, you know, anti-black racism, black resistance against, um, you know, uh, white supremacy, uh, resistance against, you know, um, racial and racist capitalism that black bodies tend to uh, be positioned. And we talked about that really well in terms of referring that to black domestic workers, right? Um, you know, um, the everyday, the different forms of black, of violence against black bodies that continue to, you know, to prol proliferate in this society. So um, when I read the way in which, starting from your own coming into yourself, but also your, um, your, your um, uh, uh, leaving um, on your own terms, you know, um, um, ben, what's that public? What's that public? Does anybody remember that? <laughs> that guy, and that guy, right. Um, uh, you know, that in itself was a form of individual resistance, right? But throughout the book, you speak to that. And I want to talk about that because I want people to understand that this was also a book about black people rising up and confronting on an everyday basis. Even mothers, you talked about who confronted teachers in school. It's a way of confronting anti-black racism. So I wanted to talk yeah, about no, that. No, I see resistance in, um, you know, I know I see some of my friends here from York region who fought with Charlene Grant, right? Because Charlene Grant was on the end of a racial slur by a school board trustee at the time named Nancy Elgie. And then Nancy Elgie decided that for three months, she wasn't going to resign. She didn't say, I didn't say that. She didn't say it was right for me to say that. She just said, I'm a good person. Don't make me have any consequences. And Charlene said the most brilliant thing when Nancy LG called her and said, I want to apologize to you for calling you a nigger. Well, of course, she didn't say it then, but you know. Um, <laughs> that'd be some sentence if somebody ever did call you a nigger. <laughs> When she called to apologize, Charlene said, I will sit down with you, Nancy. I'm glad you called. I will sit down with you for your apology to me as soon as you resign. <laughs> and it took a couple of months more for her to resign after that. That was Charlene's resistance. And I saw how people in your region whose children were also being the targets of racism rose up and fought with her. That was the reason why Nancy ended up resigning. Yeah, me leaving the Toronto Star because it's okay for white women to be an activist, but never anybody else writing for the newspaper. That was my resistance. So. <laughs> Certainly Black Lives Matter Toronto stopping the Pride Parade. Maybe the most misunderstood public demonstration of the 21st century in Canada. Maybe. Um, and I'm, it was such a privilege to be able to cite your work in reminding us about how long people within, even like before what we formally call Pride Now, how long black queer people have been 
fighting to be visible, to be included, to be paid, to be in the leadership of queer organizing, of, of celebration, of visibility. Um, it's been happening for a lot longer than people want to recognize. And so when BLMTO finally stopped the parade, that was their resistance. And a lot of people didn't want to hear it, but it was so important. Phil, the work that you and Education Not Incarceration did to finally rid the Toronto District School Board of that program. And I want to be vigilant and say that like, we always have to assume that it's not really over because one school board out of the two major school boards voted to get rid of the cops and the other did not. But even the school board that did it, there were still a lot of people in there that really wanted the police to stay and all the politicians would bring them all back tomorrow if they could. Of course, not in the rich private schools or not in the rich white people, public schools, only in the poor, lower middle class and lower class black and brown people schools. That's the only place where police are apparently like valuable. But that was your guys' resistance was organizing and fighting on behalf of young people that couldn't. Um, I think the resistance is not just being in the street for Beverly and stopping traffic, although that is important. And I think that that's the challenge sometimes is that people feel like, well, I'm, what if I can't or don't want to do that kind of thing? How do I engage? How do I um, participate? Um, I think that, oh, thank you for your comments. Uh, I think that individual resistance is very important for letting people feel like they have some sort of power over their environment. Um, I graduated high school in 2013. There was an officer in my school. Um, I went to James Cardinal Mogadon Catholic High School. Uh, so to read about the Catholic school board that wanted um, police in schools at the time, um, it was sort of jarring to me because I was like, oh, that's, that's, my, that's my school, that's my school board. Um, and I remember whenever there was a fight, um, you would see the officer sort of running down the hallway um, to sort of investigate. Um, I don't know if my brain has sort of set that aside, um, but I know that in my spaces now, the ones that I occupy, I'm very sort of involved in uh, the literary community in Toronto. I find resistance simply in just being there and sort of letting people know that, you know, any sort of jokes or comments that you thought you could make if there were no black people there, you can't do that now because I'm here. <laughs> and even in the work that I write now and the work that I share, I make now an active effort in sort of including and highlighting my black experience in in my poetry, when before I did not do that. Mm -hmm. I thought that I had to write for this audience who didn't want to hear about, you know, how many times people would just touch my hair on the subway, or um, how many times my teachers asked if I, if the, the schoolwork that I was doing was too complicated and hard for me, maybe I would prefer a lower level. Um, or I, I remember, for example, I was doing a class in microaggressions for my master's. And I want to talk about, you know, the very famous microaggression of touching black women's hair, or black people's hair. But I paused because I thought, well, would I have to now explain or defend my entire race? I was the only black person there. I got a lot of questions. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in, in spaces now, I find that I have more um, I find that I have more power and more comfort in, in being there. It's sort of like reverse to my isolationism. I'm like, well, if I'm the only person here, then that matters that I'm here at all. I want to, I want to reach out to other black writers, who, emerging writers who might not feel comfortable entering uh, certain literary spaces because they don't see any black people there. But I want to be that black person saying, yes, hello, I am you know, a featured reader of the series. I'm going to read this poetry. I'm going to go to um, an art gallery and <coughs> mark them and read, things like that. That's, that's how I sort of take resistance into my hands. Um, 
I don't feel like I have a great answer for this question, but I, I'll just share my thoughts. Um, it's conversation thoughts. Conversation. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> um, for me, I think resistance is about uh, remaining human. And what I mean by that is, is that you know, every, almost every day, at least a few times a week, I receive an email from somebody asking me to write an expose because um, you know their child is being um, harassed in school, or because they've experienced some form of anti-blackness in the workplace. And um, it just, in those situations, it just highlights to me the magnitude of the problem, the magnitude of the, the disease that is anti-blackness. And so, for me, it's about remaining human. In the face of that, it's about you know mentoring youth, you know being in conversation with youth, and helping them hang on to their 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 youthfulness in a society that constantly hyper masculinizes, hyper you know makes them adults, doesn't allow black children to be children. Um, it's about folks who um, you know email me, people who have. Um, you know, sickle cell, for example, and they go to the, hotel, the hospital and they ask for pain meds and they're denied the medication. They're told that they're, this is drug-seeking behavior, something like that. All of these things are anti-black and designed to strip people of their humanity. Um, you know, people shouldn't have to live in pain. People should be able to enjoy their youth and be children. So for me, resistance is about hanging on to my humanity. Celebration of genocide. Right? Um, it's because of all kinds of different pockets of resistance that were like coming together under the banner of I don't know more that I think a lot of people started to become more aware. I think I don't know more and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
are the two things that have happened recently, and I would add recently to the missing and murdered women, indigenous girl, or indigenous women and girls, and two-spirit people. The, the the inquiry that people demanded of the government and forced to happen to make broader indigenous struggles in Canada visible. We don't want to talk about it in school, right? We don't learn about it. I certainly did not learn. I remember being actually in like grade 12 and taking an elective history class mm -hmm. and they taught us about the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that was. And if you don't know, I would highly recommend that you go home yes. and say, what's the Trail of Tears to Siri or whoever you like to talk to when you're at home. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like, it's hard because what I see happening too is then the reliance shifts on that very capitalist, individualistic, well, it's your responsibility to then, well, no, it's Black Lives Matter Toronto's responsibility now to do the hard work, or it's, I don't know, more activists' responsibility to put themselves at risk, when even that is not possible and sustainable. It's not, it's, it, it has to be even bigger than that. And the fact that groups can disrupt government every now and again can get in the headlines every now and again, even can shut down a program or two every now and again. Even that, we're being so outpaced by white supremacy and capitalism that um, something, something so much broader. Something has shifted because let's 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 just again now um, we've always had social movements. I mean, black activism has been happening in this this country for decades, okay? And I think sometimes that gets forgotten, right? Um, we are at this juncture, but there was a lot that happened prior to getting to this juncture. As I was reading through, and you're reading, I was seeing from Black Lives Matter, all of the kinds of similarities in terms of the kinds of uh, tactics that we used um, in the past. I mean, in the past, we even used much more rigorous tactics that could have gotten us that, that you know in, in particular kinds of ways. Now what you have is you have um, you know um, I think you know our age of media also allows us some uh, stands in for some safety mechanism that we didn't have before. We didn't have yeah you know, I mean if you get blown apart nobody there to to to, to take a picture or to witness. So there are some uh, shifts now in terms of what we can capture about what's happening that allows us to take some particular kinds of risk which were taken before but were taken differently because we have to take them in groups and in collectives because they were our they were our witnesses mm. right mm -hmm. we didn't have cameras to witness our, 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 our the brutality right um, so um, what I'm saying is that um, there's always been a struggle. But yes, you're right, there's something that's happened with the onslaught of neoliberalism <coughs> and the, the shift, as we're seeing globally, right? Uh, uh, in terms of capital, in terms of, you know, the way that white supremacy uh, and a certain kind of white nationalism has taken root. So there's something that, that is creating a particular kind, you know, of, um, of uh, difficulty for us to build movements. But we also, I think, have lost a certain, a certain um, uh, sense of, you know, whether it is we have been, become so disparate, you know, in, 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 in terms of, you know, struggle, that it makes it very difficult for us to conceive of what building a movement could be, or what it could be like, or if there's even any possibility of building a movement. And I don't think that we, I don't think a lot of us think about building movements because we wouldn't, we don't know where to start. And I guess that's the reason why I, I'm seeing your look. You're looking at me like, oh my God, what was you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not at my favorite face, but um, okay. yeah, I, I do feel that like my words. How was you talking about? I don't know, I feel like my words were maybe a bit mischaracterized, but I, I can. Uh? I just think, so, I mean, not to, I just think that, um, I, I feel that there's been a bit of a false dichotomy created between 
what I said about sort of humanizing, uh, maintaining my humanity and movements, because actually part of my humanity is engaging in, in movement yeah. and in community. The other thing too is that um, part of that dichotomy is putting movement on, a, I think, on a pedestal, because actually I think there's a lot of movements that replicate systems of domination, um, of misogyny, of capitalism. There are lots of movements that um, there are many movements that that inadvertently or sometimes sometimes consciously, you know, treat activists like batteries. They wring them out like sponges. They just, they use up the energy and then dispose of them. And so I think that that's something that we need that that we need to talk about if we're actually going to talk about this. Yes, yes, we need to talk about movement. Yes, we need to talk about humanity. But I, I don't think these two things are actually um, separate from one another or in conflict with one another. I, I still agree with that. And so that's that's just the thing I want to say to put out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand um, sort of what you were saying about the idea that there's this there's a disparate sense of uh, of sort of work and, and reality that makes it hard to um, build movements. Um, in my in my own life, I found myself very sort of isolated from those movements. I would see them from afar and be like, oh well, you know, what if? But then I would go back to you know studying or trying to build what my parents sort of wanted me to become in Canada uh, when, they, when they immigrated. And I've never really found like a way to, with, with like right now with my, with my experiences being so um, separate, I've never really found a way to sort of get involved in the ways that I'm comfortable with because I feel, well, you know, they, it, it, because it's a different reality, you know, I don't have experience with. Um, sort of activism and protest and my own experience, my own like individual black experience might not be the kind that they're looking for. Oh, I'm getting little signals. <laughs> no, I know that, that that was it. Like I I, I feel almost um, a form of trepidation and even even approaching. I just want to add, I'm just to add one thing to go oh, yeah. <laughs> But before I just wanted to, to think, I think now you're talking about that cotton, but I also think um, I also think there's a certain kind of homogenizing of what movements mean in your conversation because you're assuming there's a particular way to build a movement or there's a particular kind of movement that can only transpire. And I think that is, is, is and that needs to be thought about. I'm not saying that we go back, I'm saying movements, you know, um, they take on different kinds of textures. Mm -hmm. So it's about thinking about what that would look like today. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to say one, before we, Finish. I wanted to acknowledge and to also say in terms of one of the things in the book that I was very um, I was very pleased about uh, was the fact that you did acknowledge that a lot of the work you know um, in terms of you know um, organizing in terms of uh, uh, the way in which particular kinds of strategies and particular things happen that a lot of the work was done by women black feminist, black feminist activists, black feminist lesbians, we call queers today, but we used to use lesbians in the past, but <laughs> some of us still do. Um, and and, and I, 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 I wanted to acknowledge that that was very important for those of us um, who, you know, who recognize, or who, that you recognize that the work that you see happening today had its foundation in terms of the work that black feminist activists started here, you know, in the 60s, in the 70s, 80s, mm. and that there was something there that women built, and it's on women's bodies, mm. and black women's bodies, that the state continues mm. its, you know, nationalist, white nationalist, and capitalist war mm. on our backs. And that, that was evident in your book around border, you know, crop on border issues, and around the way, um, you know, um, uh, like, uh, the, um, like uh, for instance, Dion was treated, the way black women are treated, they are gendered and sexualized in a particular way. So those things were very important, so I, I wanted to acknowledge that. So I guess, uh, it's time to sell and sign some books. <laughs> <laughs> Question mark? Um, but actually, there, there's one order. Can you, can you um, ad lib for 30 seconds if you could? Ad lib? Okay. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> yes, he needs to do something. Are you all? Uh, this light, this light is a killer, I must say. Barely, I can barely handle it. You all okay? <laughs> Enjoyed the conversation so far? By this book. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. I, I appreciate you, Beth. And, yes, um, yes. I, I honestly do. Yes. And, and Therese and Phil, so some of you might understand and know already that uh, Norbasi Philip was going to be the person joining me on stage this evening. We had a whole conversation planned out. I had different readings planned out. I was very excited about that. And Norbasi fell ill this morning. So the wonderful people who were on the stage with me got calls, panicked calls at work. <laughs> today and um, Andrew of, our, of uh, another story our booksellers was trying to calm me down and saying Desmond uh, you've done a lot of work and people want to help you today mm. and she was right so thank you to all of you for coming through I appreciate you so much. Business that I'm very excited about. Oh my gosh, look at the time. Um, I would like to invite everybody in the hall this evening to, um, in the spirit of the ongoing struggle that we are all fighting for, uh, because I know that's why you're here, um, I would like to ask you to do something. Um, it's a petition that I would like you to sign. And I'm going to get as many of you to do that right now, um, digitally, if possible. Um, so you can get out your phone right now while I'm talking to you. I'd like you to, actually. There's free Wi-Fi. There's free Wi-Fi? Yes. But now everybody's going to need the password, so I don't want to do it. 50,000 people. It's always free and accessible. Open Wi-Fi. So um, there is a petition. So I'll make it easy if anybody in the room uh, follows me on Twitter or follows me on Facebook. It is the last thing that I posted right when this gathering was beginning this evening. You can go right there and you can see it. If you Google change.org justice for Santina, S-A-N-T-I-N-A, -N you will find this petition also, justice for Santina, change.org. Um, this petition was created this afternoon by my comrade, L. Jones. L. Jones is uh, one of the people whose uh, work I detail in this story, in this book, I should say, excuse me, and um, she's in Halifax and does a lot of excellent work there. And um, the, the petition that I would have you sign that L. has posted let me open it. And I would like to just read it to you. Some of you might know this story because in the last couple of weeks it's been in the Canadian media. On January 15, 2020, multiple police officers inside a Halifax, Nova Scotia Walmart assaulted Santina Rayo in front of her two children after accusing her of stealing groceries. When police and Walmart staff confronted Santina, and she offered that they search her belongings, police shifted tactics and asked for Rayo's identification. Multiple officers ultimately attacked Santina, broke her wrist, and left her with a concussion and bruises all over her body. The police then laid three criminal charges on Santina, saying she assaulted the police, resisted arrest, and created a disturbance inside the Walmart. We are beyond tired of the attacks on black people across Canada, especially by the police who have never served and protected black people. We are fed up with police forces that apologize for racial profiling but never stop doing it. We have no more patience for politicians who cover for the police and ask us to wait for the next bogus investigation before we judge them. We therefore demand that 
One, the Crown's office in Nova Scotia immediately dropped all criminal charges against Santina Rayo. Number two, the Crown's office investigated and charged all officers involved in the assault on Santina Rayo. And number three, that Walmart Canada, who by the way have said not a word in the almost three weeks since this happened, that Walmart Canada immediately lift its nationwide ban of Santina Rayo because after they sick the police on her, after they, I, I didn't mean to use that word like sick, like after they set the police on Santina, they gave her a nationwide ban from every Walmart. And so when two days later there was a demonstration, Santina couldn't go because she wasn't allowed on the property. So we're asking that Walmart Canada immediately lift its nationwide ban of Santina Rayo and compensate her for the violent intervention initiated by its employees. If you have a phone and you can see what I'm reading right now, and you have the opportunity to sign it. I want you to sign it tonight before you leave this room. I want you to post this petition and use the hashtag justice for Santina. And every stop across this country that I go, starting next week, Ottawa, uh, Montreal, I will be in Halifax next week. I will be in Calgary and Vancouver and Winnipeg and I'll be going a lot of places with this book. We are going to sign this petition so that the Crown drops these ridiculous charges against our sister. I want you to help me do that tonight. Um, so again, that, it's much, much, and we're still thinking about DeFonte Miller and um, April 9th. It's April, I know it because April 9th is my birthday, actually, and um, I'm hoping I'm hoping that we're going to get a guilty verdict on April 9th for the police officer and his brother who attacked Defonte. But um, yeah, it's it's time for me to do some other stuff tonight. So um, thank you. Please share this petition, Justice for Santina Rayo. I am so overwhelmed by this crowd. You have no idea. I am dreaming right now. Like, seriously, thank you to everybody for being here this evening. Get your books signed. I gotta get this fine for Dean and Melanie. Oh my god. That's yeah, that's why I got it for them. <laughs> get up to hug you. That was fabulous. We need to just do something with you and the women. I love it.